Isaiah 55. There's only 13 chapters in this book, 13 verses. So can we read all of them? All right, I am going to look at it from the NIV version. When you find it, say, I got it. I got it. Hallelujah. Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what is not satisfied? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the riches of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made with him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. I want you to take a look at verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Watch this. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper and instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Father, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Do you love the word? Yeah. Shout hallelujah. You may be seated. Verses 6 and 7 is where I really want to focus my point, but I wanted to read the entire of that particular chapter to give you context of what's going on in the book of Isaiah. But if you look at 6, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and our God, for he will freely pardon. I want to use for just a small subject for the next 29 minutes, one word called seekers. Everybody shout, seekers. Yes. Seekers. I love Netflix. I love to watch Netflix on a regular basis when I get the opportunity if I'm not working. It's nothing like a great series. It's nothing like watching a great show that I can binge watch and be sleepy at work the next day. <laughs> However, every now and then a great movie comes on. And when I catch a great movie, I'll make plans to watch that show. One of the movies that I wanted to watch was The Jesus Revolution. How many of you guys saw that show? Yeah. Really? So the rest of you have not watched Jesus. <laughs> so I, I made plans. I wanted to see The Jesus Revolution. So I'm going to ruin it for some of you that haven't seen it. So in this particular movie, it's about the hippie generation, Woodstock, but at the same time, the church is over here with like 15 people in it. And Woodstock is packed, young people everywhere giving God's glory, long hair like mine, they're smoking, they're doing acid, they're drinking, and they're deciding, hey, we're going to love instead of go to war. At the same time, there's this one character that comes through his name's Lonnie, and Lonnie's walking down the street, 
with long hair, but he's got this long cape on. It's got Jesus on the back. The pastor of the church, she's a young person, but she's done with the church. She's like, look, your church is boring, dad, and her dad's the pastor. She's like, your church is boring, dad, I don't want to go anymore. He's upset, Lonnie's walking down the street. She pulls over because she sees Jesus on the guy's the back of his jacket. She says, hey, you want to ride? He gets in the car, he's talking about the Lord. And she's like, yo, you need to meet my dad. So she takes him to the house. But before she gets there, she's with him all night long. So the introduction is crazy because when it comes back on, dad is going to get some coffee. And all of a sudden, she's like, hey, you need to meet this guy. I spent the night with him. He's like, what the heck? What do you mean? I spent the night with him. She's like, meet this guy. I'm telling you, when you hear him talk, he's going to blow your mind. So all of a sudden, they start sitting down. He puts him out, comes back in, and he says to him, tell me about your generation. Tell me about your people, because I don't understand them. Lonnie looks at Chuck. Lonnie's the guy with the long hair, and Lonnie says, my people are sheep, but not a shepherd. And Chuck looked at him. He says, they're going after drugs and alcohol and partying because they're looking for God. He says, and your people, Chuck, you've closed the door to your church. And so we've got nowhere to go. He says, but if you would just open up your heart and see us for who we are, you'd be surprised at what could happen and the revolution that could take place. And it was in that part of the movie where I just paused it myself and I started to cry because I got to thinking about personally all the things that I sought after, all the things that I was seeking for, when it was just so easy for me to really seek Jesus. But I didn't go after him because I went after everything else, whether it was drugs, whether it was sports, whether it was ball, whatever, whatever was out there, I went after it. I was seeking for it. And it took me to become broken and hit rock bottom before I could find Jesus. But I, what I want to stop is us crashing before we find him. I believe we can find him while we're on our way up. I believe we can find him when we're going after our careers. I believe we can find a deeper relationship while we're going after the one we want to marry. That we don't have to be on our deathbed to find Jesus. I want you to look at somebody and say, I love Jesus. I love him. I love him. I love him. I even got on myself after watching this message. I got on to myself. As I preach all around the world and I asked myself, how much have I actually talked about Jesus in my sermon? I know I mentioned him. I know that the sermon is constructed around him to get people to say yes to him. But I thought about it. I'm not going to preach another message unless I mention his name 30 times. So somebody say, you got 29 more to go. Jesus means so much to me that when I rewind time and look at my life, when everyone said, it's over for you, you won't live past 19, Jesus was still there. When I lost jobs, when I lost popularity, when I lost money, Jesus was still there. At the end of the day, when I walked away from my own dreams and my own family, Jesus was still there. What I love about him, as I continue to move into this text, he's been seeking us since day one. The Bible says that he came seeking who he will save. He wants to seek and save the lost. But what's also interesting, Jesus is seeking to save the lost, and then Satan is seeking whom he may devour. So there's an entire seek battle that is going on your entire existence in this world. And if you don't figure out how to find the right crowd and find the right church and find the right support and find the right girlfriend and find the right boyfriend, you will be manipulated by somebody seek. Wish I had a witness here. Somebody shout hallelujah. I done got happy already. He says he's seeking whom he may devour. So then Satan uses manipulation. He uses people to try to twist your mind, twist your feelings so you can get 
caught up in your emotions. And what happens when you try to seek Jesus? See how they taught me as a kid? It's like he was up there. And so we're seeking to find him. But the truth is, he's in here. So if he's in here, the reason why many of us don't get to him is because we have to seek past us to find him. You have to seek past your emotions, seek past, seek past your fears, seek past your own belief, your belief system. You have to seek past what you've been taught as a child that certain sins would keep God from loving you. You have to seek past a system of religion that has broken your mindset to make you think that you've got to be perfect for God to walk with you. But what I found out is that we've got a God that loved us while we were sinners. He did not wait for you to get right. He did not wait for you to change. He says, I love you in your dirty drawers, in your messed up mind, with your messed up circumstance. I'll jump into your life and change your life. I wish I had at least 200 seekers that would get off your butt and give God glory. Glory to God. Look at somebody and tell them I'm a seeker. I'm seeking after him. I'm not seeking no woman. I'm not seeking no man. I'm not seeking no job. I'm not seeking any drugs. I'm seeking Jesus. Somebody one more time shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Let me see it. Glory to God. In Ecclesiastes, take this note, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, watch this. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. That's Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. Watch what he says. He has set eternity... In the human heart. Now the Bible also tells us that the heart is deceitfully wicked. So what is he saying to us in Ecclesiastes? That even in this heart that is deceitfully wicked, I have dropped heaven inside of you. But the issue is, everything that we seek after keeps us from recognizing what he's already dropped inside of you. So your seek, your focus, your pursuits, your concentration, if Jesus is nowhere in it, it will drive you away from what God has already put inside of you. What theologians call that is a God-sized hole. That a God-sized hole is sitting in your heart. And while that God-sized hole is there, all he's reminding you is no matter how far you go, there's a piece of me that is constantly sitting inside of you. And the only reason you can't recognize it is because you're so caught up in what you're personally after. And you won't seek me for guidance. You won't seek me for wise counsel. But I came in here today to break that off of your life. Because you're going to start seeking Jesus before you start seeking for a new job. Before you start seeking for a new home. Before you start seeking for a new location. You're going to ask Jesus, what do you have to say about this? Turn over to Romans. Turn over to Romans. Turn to Romans. In Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through 20. Paul describes it a little bit more. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people. Watch it. Who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it, what did he say? Plain to them. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made 
so that people are without excuse. So the Roman writer is telling you, he's in there. Eternity is in there. But what we get ourselves into suppresses the truth that God has already made plain to you. So this is why you can find yourself halted between two opinions because something inside of you is saying, I know better. While somebody else is seeking to pull you from better. But you've got to learn how to seek God regardless of who's in your circle. I wish you'd look at somebody next to you and tell them, if you're not a God seeker, you're going to have to move today. Now I know some of you didn't want to say it because you brought them to church. Yep. And you're going to eat brunch with them after church. But just maybe. 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 It is your company that's keeping you from seeing the truth. Not the truth about the church, but the truth about Jesus. And so you have people in your life, you start valuing their experiences. Their experiences become your word instead of the living word of God. And so instead of seeing what the Bible says, you're constantly rehearsing what they said. And because you can see the manifestation of what they went through, and sometimes you don't directly see what the word says because you got to test it, you got to try it, you got to walk it out. But you could possibly be living from the revelation of somebody's pain instead of looking and seeing what the word of God has to say about you. And I don't know what you're going through and I don't know how bad it is to you. But one thing I found out about Jesus, and I think I'm about 15 times now. One thing I found out about Jesus, 14, <laughs> is there was a song that my mother used to say. You don't know it, but I'm going to tell you. Have you tried Jesus? And then the other side of the congregation would say, he's all right. Glory to God. Somebody called it. Somebody knew it. Somebody got some grandparents that go to church. I'm going to this side. Why don't you ask the question? And this side, you answer the question. One, two, three. Somebody know that he's all right. I want you to grab your neighbor and tell him he's all right. That means whatever circumstance you've gone through, he's all right. It may not be right, but he's all right. Whatever you've done has not surprised him. And he's not afraid of what you've gone through. But you've got to know how bad it is. He's still all right. Glory to God. He's all right. Once I came to the conclusion that God didn't think I was as bad as people. then I got all right. Because the beauty of knowing that he's all right helps you to understand that you're actually all right too. And God will walk you through the healing process. And you don't have to worry about what people say. And I know that's easier said than done. But the minute you recognize that God didn't make a mistake when he made you, you will have the most powerful testimony in the world. And what happens in our text is that Isaiah is a major prophet in the Old Testament. And he's known for prophesying the coming of the Messiah. Hundreds of years before he comes. And not only that, he's prophesying judgment. Showing them of the challenges that are coming. The Babylonian captivity that Jeremiah goes in depth to discuss. But Isaiah presents it and says, this is the case. Stop seeking after other gods. And then he opens up 55. And 55 is an invitation and a trigger. 55 says, come to those that are thirsty. Your thirst is a trigger. That trigger is telling you, I need something. 
The Bible says, he that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. But part of the problem is we've gotten to the place that we're okay with thirsting for God. But it just depends on where we are when the thirst comes. Okay? If I'm in church and I'm at home alone, then it's okay for me to be thirsty and let me pull out my word and let me consecrate. But if God decides to trigger thirst while you're in the middle of sin, which thirst will you obey? Will you stop in mid-practice of whatever it is you're doing? Stop and hear what God has to say. The Bible says let him hear what the spirit has to say unto the church. And you are the church. So thirst becomes the trigger. Thirst becomes the invitation telling you that there is something that needs to change because there's a behavior in you that's saying, feel me, feel me, feel me. This is that God-sized hole that is activating inside of you telling you I need something to live. You're feeding your spirit everything else but me. You love to drink. You love to smoke. You love to hang. You love to talk. But what about me? It's the same thing that happens in the New Testament when the Samaritan woman meets Jesus right there at the well and Jesus tells her, if you drink that water, you will thirst again. But if you drink this water, you will never thirst again. This is the deciding moment. Will you be stuck in a cycle of feeding yourself with moments that will make you feel good temporarily? Or will you forsake your ways, forsake your flesh, forsake your own mind, forsake your thoughts? Forsake your habits and try a drink that will cause you to never have to drink again. I wish I had a witness over here in Social Dallas. But somebody, look at somebody else and tell them I want the second drink. I want the drink that I can drink when I'll never have to drink again. Because I don't have time to continue smoking and going out to cure what I think is going on on the inside. When God is saying, take this and it'll handle that. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Tell you. He says, take this. You never have to drink again. So if I take the second drink, it's easier for me to go where I came from, already full. I hope you caught it. They're like, hey girl, we're going out tonight. And we're going to go on to get full before we get there. And you can tell them, I'm going to go out with you, but I'm already full. Yeah. Yeah, I know some of y'all thought I was going to say, you say you ain't supposed to go. No, I'm going out. I'm going to go out and I'm going to pull somebody out. I wish I had a witness here. How is it that you came in here tonight already sober-minded and feeling good because I was already full when I got here. But I wasn't full off of cognac. I was full off of the Holy Ghost. I wish I had a witness in here. Have I got any full people in here that are full off of Jesus, full off of his power, full off of his anointing, full off of his glory? Already full. See, when you're already full, low stuff can't attract you. When you're already full, you can discern people's spirit. I don't have to get in a relationship with you to find out you ain't no good. I read you when I met you. Now, I'm not going to treat you bad. You don't have the nerve because even you know I'm full. Have I got a witness here? Tell somebody tell them we don't drink the same thing. Hey, somebody shout hallelujah. I'm full of Jesus. I'm full of power, full of the anointing. 
I feel like I'm in revival right now. So let me tell you, I ain't talk, I'm not talking theory, I'm talking fact. I'm a big black brother. And when I go back home, they are amazed because he should be dead. And I love to go back. And I love to walk around because I want them to see what Jesus does when he gets a hold of you. I'm trying to get you to understand that thirst that you feel is the trigger. And once you come out of that thirst, the next portion of the scripture I want you to write down is time. Time. Thirst and then time. Why time, Joel? Seek the Lord while he may be found. There was a portion of time. The Bible says that man was appointed a time to be born and a time to die. You only have so much time to find him. And as much as you think tomorrow is promised, it is not. And it is not that God is hiding from you. But there is a little bit of cat and mouse when it comes to God. Why is that a little cat and mouse with God? Because God has all of these spiritual blessings in store for you. But he knows you're not ready for them. So he'll reveal himself just a little bit from time to time. He'll give you a flash to show you your future. You'll have a dream about what you're supposed to be. You'll run up against somebody who has an opportunity for you. You'll see somebody that'll tell you, you remind me of, of me. You'll get a raise and you didn't even deserve it. You'll get a promotion and you, you didn't deserve it. All of that, those are glimpses of God revealing pieces of himself. Because he said, you're not quite ready. But because I love you, I'm going to show you what I can do for you. And all of us in this room have experienced glimpses of God. And you know you are in sin. But yet God loved you so much, he still was good to you. He will reveal glimpses of himself. How we know this to be true? Because even Zechariah, uh, 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 is that his name? Not Zechariah. What's the little short man's name, y'all? Zacchaeus. Preacher forget? Come on. Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus. And what did he do? He climbed to see him. Why? Because the objective of a seeker is to what? See. I didn't, I didn't start seeking to not see. When I was a kid, we used to play this game. I'm way older than you. I'm like four, I'm six years older than your pastor. When I was a kid, they put us outside. Y'all don't go outside. When I was a kid, my mama put a, a glass of water, a big thing of water on the porch and a watermelon and a knife and locked the door. And we was outside. That's child abuse, now that I think about it. 100 degrees. We didn't care. We wanted to be outside. But one of the best games in the world 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 30, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, find somebody and that's what Satan wants you to think that you can't find God in what you're going through but you may have to be like Zacchaeus and climb over everything so you can see Jesus just like Moses Moses says I want to see you God and God said well if you want to see me no man has seen my face and lived but Moses said, I still want to see you. So he said, go hide in the cleft of the rock. And Moses hid. And he got a chance to see God just walk by. And the Bible says he saw his hinder parts. I'm telling you, if you get busy seeking God, 
in the time that you have. Because the only time you got is right now. You'd be surprised that God will walk by your situation. He'll walk by your house. He'll walk by your mother that needs to be healed. He'll walk by your marriage. He'll walk by your circumstance. He'll walk by whatever you need him to walk by. But the Bible says when he walked by Moses, Moses had so much glory on him. I wish I had a Bible reader in here. Moses had so much glory on him just from God walking by that he had to cover his face. I wish you would get so much glory on you that it would shock everybody that you're with. That you may have to cover yourself because God's glory has been on your life. And if they need a blessing, give them a flash. Somebody shout hallelujah. God's about to do something for everybody in this room. But you can't be afraid to seek him right now. I want everybody to look at somebody and tell them we're going higher. We're about to seek Lord for whatever we need. We're going to seek him for our life. We're going to seek him for our spouse. We're going to seek him for healing. We're going to seek him for power. We're going to seek him for grace. We're going to seek him for joy. We need Jesus. Rest on your feet. I can't go through all these, but I will give you the last one. I'm just going to talk it. You are the target. So you should have thirst, time. Turn was the next one that I didn't go through. But target is the last one. You are the target of God's seek. How we know that to be true? Because the text clearly says, I'm going to pardon you. And he says, don't try to compare how I feel to the people that you hang with. My ways are not like your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He said, just like the water, the snow and the rain, it left me and came to you. The reason we know that the water worked is because when the water hits the dry ground, the ground changes. The ground soaks up what God gave. And then the ground yields whatever was underneath it. Fruit, trees, whatever was there. That water does not return back to God until what was in the ground comes up. And then it goes back as vapor. It doesn't go back as water. And he says, that's what I want to do for you. I want to touch you in a way. And you need to understand that my word is not going to return unto me void. Just like that water. If I spoke something over your life, whatever's in your heart is coming out. And I want you to yield it and let it go. Because this is about to be a season for you that your seeking God changed your entire world. It's going to change your relationships. It's going to change your children. It's going to change your outlook. It's going to change everything about you. And I'm going to walk off this stage, but before I do, anybody in this room that says, you know what? I want to do a better job seeking. I want you to come to this altar. And we want to pray for you for about three minutes. Not that long. But if you're, in that, and if you're in the seats, I want you to get up and come to this altar right now. Because Satan desires to sift you as wheat. The Bible says, Jesus said, I prayed for you. And we're going to pray for you real quickly. Come, 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 come. You're about to take your seek to a whole nother level. You're going to be on your own consecration. You're going to have so much influence with your circle that your circle won't call you for mess in your opinion but they'll call you for a word and they're gonna call you for prayer come closer I'm gonna call you that's it can you clap your hands for these people that are coming here Pastor Taylor, 
Am I handing you this? Come on, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. I want all of you out there to point your hands towards them. Father, we thank you for everyone that is here. Everyone that's standing here saying, I want to seek Jesus. I want his word on my life. I want his power, his anointing on me. I'm tired of running after things that have given me a temporary fix. I want to go stronger. I want to be more powerful. I need grace in this season. I need you, Jesus, in my heart. It's not about filling, but I'm digging past all of that to get to the core of who I am. Because as I go into this season, I believe I have enough power to command the blessing over my life. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm dealing with, it will not overtake me. It will not overwhelm me. For I have peace that surpasses all understanding. And I'm going to seek you in the best of times and in the worst of times. I will be balanced with my seek. And I thank you for what you're doing in my life. I thank you for what you're doing in my career. And I give you glory and I give you praise in Jesus' name. If you believe what you prayed, come on and give God glory.